I want to show you an important scripture and then we're going to jump because last night at about 9.15 p.m., an anointing of God came as I was sitting on the living room and the Lord said, this is what you must speak this morning. So I want to bring the word of the Lord. But before that, I want to show how it ties up with our series that we are doing, Prepare the Way of God. Amen. In the book of uh, Ephesians, in the epistle of Ephesians, chapter 4, we looked at a scripture which Paul said, we are, not, we are not tossed to and fro. Okay, wait. Ephesians chapter 4. Everybody waiting for me. Ephesians chapter 4. Where is it? Okay. In verse... Uh, 13, 13, 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God and to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. In other words, this maturity that is shown to us, it is not our maturity, it's not how much we have grown on our own but there is a measurement that was given to us that measurement must measure to the fullness of Christ and how many years have I been given to do and accomplish that till you are breathing on earth that's how long it has been given because once you stop breathing it's done are you with me it is not an end so if, if you say, I've been in church for 40 years, I've seen that, I've heard all kinds of sermon, you are in for a surprise because God has much more to teach us. God is much more to show us. How come you are so surprised when your our children are t telling something new that they've never heard before? How come you're so surprised? Because that knowledge which they are able to say now in that speed was not available then. Are you with me? So now we are very surprised. Now it is human and yet we are so surprised. How much more God who created heaven and earth, He can show us the Bible in such a way you have never thought it was there. But God has this power to pull different thoughts and different strings together and show us in a different strain. Amen. Amen. And we must be able to know that we are being thought by God. Okay, now the, here the Bible says the fullness of Christ. That means there is a, a grace that God is going to manifest that we will carry the fullness of God means we will start maturing. Amen. Amen. Now listen guys, this is not a Sunday school church. Aren't you glad? That means I'm not going to sing Sunday school songs all the time. I'm not going to keep on preaching about Jesus loves you. This I know, you already know, right? Do you know or you don't know? See, you know, I know, everybody know. What is that to keep saying that? Oh, Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. He will never leave you. We already know all this. Amen. Let's move on to maturity. Our prayers will be answered. We already know that. If you believe you can get it, we already know that too. The Holy Spirit is in you. We already know that too. I enjoy teaching basic stuff. Time to time, we need the basic love and the grace of God. Praise God. But when God is pushing the lever up and said it's time to climb up, we just follow through. Amen. 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 There is a reason we need to mature in these end times. The devil will take it too hard. I mean, it's going to take a mature church to fight the end time works of the enemy. Amen. We cannot afford to be babyish Amen. or pretend I don't know, I thought so, I wish, I did not know now. Pfft, please don't. Amen. It's time to get out of that. I want to give you an example to illustrate it like in an everyday challenge. You see, I was into scuba diving. I, I took until uh, dive master. I, uh, I tried to overcome my boredom, uh, so I was doing that, 
and I found that a lot of my friends were caught up into so many things, so I couldn't reach out to them. At that time, I was not having a church. I was traveling night in for for uh, 17 years while assisting my pastor friends in different countries, okay? So some of the weekends, I will go for diving. And um, why did I start about diving? Sorry. I didn't want to tell you about diving. I want to tell you about my motorcycle riding. After that, I went into motorcycle. Sorry. Another day, yeah? That one is another day. <laughs> we'll find a good reason to talk about that. Let's go to motorcycle riding. Now, this is that subject I want to tell you. So, um, in, in, and I'm not sure how it is done in U.S. Now, how many licenses do you have in motorcycle riding? One or two? Only one. And you can buy any CC? Yes. Okay. In, in, in Singapore, the first level, the first year, the, you can only buy up to 200 cc. Then the second year, right up to 400. And the third year, above and beyond. Okay, because to curb down unnecessary uh, accidents that happens on the road. Okay, and every time we have to go for more than 16 lessons uh, in, the, in the school of riding. Each time for each level because you're handling bigger bikes and so safety and all that. And before they give you the license, you got to watch a half an hour video. And the video is all about the accidents everybody had. The traffic cam accidents and how people die and blah, blah, blah. Basically, they say, before you take your license, stay alive. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> okay. So I went for my adventure riding. Uh, the higher CC, I had a, uh, I own a BMW 1200GS. And I did a lot of training as much, I, uh, as much as I could. And I used that vehicle, Angeline and I would go for our mission trips together to Malaysia, to Thailand, drive as, uh, ride as far, and sometimes the anointing of Elijah comes on me. <laughs> Speed is no longer the issue. Please don't do what I said, don't tell the police I said to you. <laughs> okay? <laughs> this is Malaysia, is different. Okay? So anyway... Um, we were about to ride up a very steep and very curvy mountain, mountain ride. It takes one and a half hours to reach up to the top. There's a lot of curves, there is a lot of challenges, and it's a lot of technical riding. Begin, you are shifting your gears up and down, elevation drops, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. This was my first trip, right? And there were 25 bikes. We rode nine hours to reach that mountain from Singapore to that. We started 4 in the morning. We were there at about almost 5 o'clock. Now we need to do one and a half hours ride. Now my heart was pounding because the bigger bike I'm riding, I'm all, all dressed up and all geared up. Quickly I ran to my friend. Hey, do you know what gear you should teach? He was laughing at me. And then the Holy Spirit told me something which matters to us right now. The Lord told, spoke to me he said, you are riding a higher geared, higher powered motorcycle. You are not an immature rider. You are above intermediate almost to expert level of riding your motorcycle. Are you with me? And the Lord said, you don't even have to ask someone because I'm there with you, number one. And when you are riding up, you will already know what gear you should be changing. Because you are not an immature at all. You are trained and the Lord almost like a father, you know, knocking onto my head. He said, behave like one. Somebody tell your neighbor, behave like one. Okay? I'll tell you why. Many of you here are matured Christians. And you got to behave like one. Amen. You got to show your faith like one. You got to show your prayer like one. You got to show your walk like one. Stop behaving like baby. Stop thinking you are a baby. Because sometimes you think we are humble, but sometimes we are uh, letting our soul uh, low self-esteem, and sometimes the enemy has taken away the voice of boldness. Are you with me? And there are another uh, people, another group of people. If you say you know something, they'll ask you to do things. So you better say, I don't know. This is the house of who? House of God. You're not serving a man. You are serving God. Until that 
is ingrained within our spirit, we will not be able to flourish in the house of God. Let me show you a scripture. It's a secret of a sustained blessing. Are you ready? Let's look at Psalms chapter 23. A Psalms that which we very well know. Very well know it so well. The moment I say Psalms 23, everybody know what is that first heading, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not what? Born. Right. Are you a shepherd? What? No, you're not. So it doesn't apply to you. The Lord is my shepherd. <laughs> okay. Now, the Bible says, you know this chapter, so I'm not going to go through the chapter. I just want to show you. Verse 6. Surely, let's all read together. So powerful. One, two, three, go. Surely, goodness and mercy shall all the days of my life. Now, okay, good, great. But that's not the end of that verse. In order to sustain the goodness and the mercy of God all your life, and I shall in the house of the Lord. Do you see that? The key to sustain God's goodness and grace and mercy is to dwell in the house of God. You need to know how to sustain it. And sometimes we come to the house of God for short-term blessings. I've, I'm broke. I got no other job, so now I come to church. No, it's not about that. People will come to the house of God, but soon or later they will discover our God is a faithful God. He's not looking for your tips. Yo. Did you hear what I said? He's not looking for your tips. Come and put some money in the bank. Come and drop some money because he will bless you. No, he's not a sorcerer. Our God is our Father. Somebody say amen. amen. He's not looking for your tips. He's looking for you to sow as God blesses you. The Bible says he gives you the seed to do that. When you generate the anointing of God in your heart, he says, in order to sustain my goodness and my mercy, you shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You got to be convinced. We were in a pastor's meeting, and that was, uh, I was in Australia, we were having a discussion. Uh, sometimes I gather people, and th this meeting discussion is something like, Engineering the church of the future. Okay, that means we have to think where the church is going to go and what we must do. And not many people can think that way. Everybody think for today's point. But we don't realize that we have to pr prepare the church for the future that is coming. Then we ask a question, and there were many pastors sitting. The question is, how many pastors can say, I love my church? There were more than 30, only two put up the hands, me and another pastor. Some of them were hurt. Some of them, it was a job. Some of them, it was a tryout. Imagine if we do the same questionnaire in the, ch in the church for the members. How many of us can say, I love where your glory dwells. You see, God is waiting to release the blessings of the house, the fullness of God. You see, the Bible says, the Bible says Jesus is the head, right? And we are the footstool. And the Bible says Jesus has crushed the head of the enemy. That means the church demonstrates the power and the authority of God, yes? How can the father or the head of the church release the signal from the head to release to the feet to demonstrate the anointing and the authority if I, as the feed, am disconnected to the head and I don't love it anymore? And that is why sometimes in our own personal lives, there will be these short circuits. What you hear preaching and what you read in the Bible doesn't work in our lives. And one of the short circuit is 
Do I really love the house of God? I cannot say God bless my family if you don't love your family. You will not be able to pray for your children prophetically if you don't love them. And that is why I found some people are very good when they pray for others. They can hear what God is saying. The moment they touch their family member, the anointing stops. They can't flow anymore. They can't hear anymore. Why? They are so emotionally influenced with the family member that they can't hear what God is saying about them. Are you with me? But it's time for us to mature. It is time for us to mature that we are able to hear because sometimes you are the nearest prophet your family member has. You are the nearest anointed person your family member has. Just like our sister who shared, thank you for trusting us and sharing in this family. You know, I was just sharing yesterday with Angeline last night. We were talking about something and today you'll hear me sharing in the uh, message. Sometimes we, we enjoy people's testimony, but we are not interested in the process they walk through. The pain, the challenges, the controversies, the doubts. We're not interested. We only hear the last part of the line. God delivered me. Yay! Amen! Imagine a drug addict. Imagine a person who's been to drugs and, 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 and prison and so on and so forth, right? And I, uh, we, we don't want to hear the family that gone through the challenge, the doubts that you went through. And that is the pain or the price the church has to pay together to recover our sons and daughters. Have you realized that almost every Sunday from the day I've stepped into here until now, every Sunday I never fail to mention sons and daughters. Are you with me? And I'm talking about genuine love. I'm not talking about this how a pastor talk. I'm sorry, I don't. This is how our Jesus will talk. We pay attention. We carry the burden in the house. Amen. We must be able to say we love the house of God. We love to worship Him. We love to pray. It is time that we stop behaving like a little kid. Many of you are mature. You have gone through, you know this area more than I know. You know what the enemy can trick us more than I can say. Many things I say is only by revelation because I don't know this area and I don't have to know it. I only need to know God. Amen. I don't have to know anything else in between. What God do say is what we do. Now, the difference between a prophet's preaching. There are fivefold ministry. Apostolic, an apostle, a prophet, a pastor, evangelist and teacher. All are different styles of preaching. A prophet's preaching, he, pre he preaches from the throne perspective. It's almost like you are in the Oval Office with God. He preaches from the councils of God within and he tells you what is about to happen to the public. Are you with me? So you are no longer a public. Somebody say amen. amen. Now you are upgrading yourself inside. And you got to get used to that style of preaching. You got to get used to a heavy dosage of God's word and process it and chew it. Let your mind do the working. You cannot afford to all the time be on the end result receiving. And I tell you why. Look at Psalms chapter 25. The throne room preaching or coming from inside out is different from outside in. And who are we focused? Are we not caring about? Are we not? Uh, look at Psalms 25 first. The book of Psalms chapter 25. Please go home, meditate the whole book, but look at a whole uh, chapter. Look at verse 14. Can we all read together? <laughs> Can we all read together? One, two, three, go. The friendship of the Lord is for those who... And He makes... Did you see that? The friendship of God is for those who fear Him. How many of you fear the Lord here? Yes? Okay. 
And if you are his friend, and if you fear him, he's going to teach you to know his covenants. What is a covenant? A covenant is what makes me bind myself to you. That's a covenant. I'm going to teach you how not to break away this friendship. I'm going to teach you what I like and what you like. And you know what? Are you ready for the next line? God also knows what you like and what you don't like. Isn't that amazing? It's not just about you pleasing God all the time, brothers and sisters. It is when God even pleases you. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, when you delight in the ways of God, He will give you the delights of your heart. It's not even your mouth open and prayer. The delight, and sometimes there are things that you desire, but you don't dare to ask. You think that God may be displeased. And so, this is where my diving story comes. <laughs> One part of the diving story, right? I thought, God may not be delighted in diving. You see, I come from a different mindset. I don't know. Like every Sunday I'm, I'm preaching. I've been in the church. I've never learned to do any other thing. And uh, it, it was a time as the God kept me into a leash. Just do what I'm, I, you know. And then, okay, now I trust you. Let go. Everywhere you go, whether it's a Sunday, whether it's a holiday, if people need Jesus, you are there to pray for someone. Amen? Even your holidays can become God's assignments. When, you are, when someone needs something, you are going to respond. You are always the first responder of faith, no matter where you are. Amen? And, and, and one of these moments, I was so frightened about this diving thing. I didn't know how to tell God. So one afternoon, I, I said, Lord, I want to talk to you. And I, I tell you exactly what I did, man. I went to the sofa. I sat down. And I said, Lord, please sit down. I didn't want to do the natural prayer position. I said, please come and sit down. I didn't want to look at him. I, I was looking. Like as though you are sitting with a friend, your brother or your father, whatever it is. I don't have experiences of sitting with my father and talking at all because he went into an accident. I've never had that privilege, okay? And I said, you know, I'm about to take diving. What do you think? Are you Okay with that and he and and then he spoke to me as though i was i could hear a person talking to me so clear so loud audible the lord said who do you think who created the fishes and the ocean uh you <laughs> why do you think david said even if I'm taken up to the heavens, you are there. Even if I'm down the bottom of the ocean, you are there. I say, Lord, wow. Was David a scuba diver? <laughs> I literally ask him. He must know something about diving. You see, there are many secrets in the Bible that are not revealed because we're not paying attention to it. Scuba diving did not come into play even during those times, but David must have seen some kind of a vision, some kind of an exposure, what is there under the ocean for him to even describe. And then the Lord asked me the third question, who do you think is feeding the fishes? Are not the angels who are commanded? And there are angels who take care of what happens inside the ocean. They are marine angels, and I've seen them before. What, if you want to see them, you must take scuba diving. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> the best I can do is in the baptism pool, come inside, you may see one. <laughs> I don't know what else to tell you. <laughs> you must be in some kind of scope in order to see some things. Now, if that is true, then God is willing to teach us certain things is only when we are involved in it. We are talking about this morning Preparing our hearts to reign with Jesus. The anointing came on my heart and the Lord said, preach on this. Let's go. Psalms 110. Psalms 110. 
the book of Psalms, chapter 110. We are talking about a series called Preparing Our Hearts, Preparing Our Ways, Preparing a Way for the Lord. When George, uh, if I'm not wrong, the President George Bush came to Singapore for a one night only special conference for world leaders. My, one of my friends was the president, Singapore president's personal aide. He was an elder in church. He was a major in the army. So when we were having our coffees, he was telling me all this. So he was in charge to make sure the U.S. president, when he comes, everything is taken care the way it is. The president's secret service will come two weeks before. They'll do a sweep and then the, the personal detail will come the night before, make sure the whole hotel is cleared, so on and so forth, okay? Then the, one of the issue was, it is the wrong shade of blue. You know, your presidential, you have a certain blue, right? But they painted the backdrop the wrong shade of blue, which is not the presidential color. And that was discovered in the evening. The address is 8 o'clock in the morning. What do you got to do? Repaint it throughout the night. And it was done. Can you believe this? For a human president. How much more we can do for Jesus if that is required for us throughout the night? Hello? You sure? Because in America every day minimum is three days, seven days, Two weeks, three weeks. Everybody blames the COVID. <laughs> Nobody says, Jesus said, let's do it now. How many of you are here? Amen. Can God count on us? Yes. Even if it hurts you? Yes. I want you to remember this. God is looking. If he wants to share the secret of his counsel in this time, something that is about to happen, he only looks out for his friends. Because he says, those who are his friend, the friendship of the Lord. The friendship of the Lord, Psalms 25. Do you remember that? Yeah. So now we are upgrading ourselves to have a prophetic year. You may not hear the way I'm having encounters with God, but more than anything, we have this. You got to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is speaking to you. Amen. In Psalms 110, we are looking at prepare your heart to reign with Jesus. The Lord says to my Lord, verse 1, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Look at that. Almost the same description. The Lord is sitting here and is now telling you, come and sit where? Where? Hey, it's right there in the scripture. Can you please tell me what is there? You don't have to guess. It's not a guessing work. It's not multiple choices. Only one answer. Sit where? Right hand. Not left. Please don't sit left. I didn't ask you to do that. Don't sit down like you're humbling yourself. I didn't ask you to do that too. Don't stand up because I didn't ask you to do it. Where you must sit? Come and sit here. Just beside me. Imagine the honored position. Imagine the love. Imagine the closeness is inviting you, regardless of how you feel about it. It's not of whether you feel that you are holy, sinning or not. It's not about that. Come and sit with me. Wow. You know your heart will be shivering if the Lord tells that to you. Because some of us, we never had those experiences with our fathers. We never had those things. Now, please don't buy into the world's theory. If you don't have an earthly father, you will not know how to relate to a heavenly father. Please do not buy into this theory. Amen. None of us were born with a bird, yet you know how to take care of the bird. None of us were born with a dog, yet you know how to take care of a dog. God is beyond any perfections of an earthly father. He's a heavenly father. If you don't know, you have to start learning how to do it. But you cannot limit God the Father based on your heavenly, your earthly Father because God is beyond. 
Somebody say amen. amen. This is the world's theory has robbed us of a relationship with his heavenly father. That is the beauty of accepting Jesus. It's something that you cannot explain. You cannot explain how a womb is being formed in a mother's tummy cannot be explained. How this magic of recreation takes place, no one can explain. It is the beauty of creation. It is the science of God. Somebody say, Amen. in the same way, how this beauty, the moment, you see, we are visual people. The moment you accept Jesus as your personal savior, you are born again in the spirit. The moment you close your eyes, you know there is a God who's listening to you. You can pray with your eyes open, with your eyes closed, whichever way that does not distract you. We start off by closing your eyes because you don't want to pay attention. You don't want to care what people are doing. You know how the Jewish people used to pray? They will put a covering around them. When they are praying and they are moaning, they are crying, they are not interested what others are looking, seeing, saying. They cover and they are in the secret place of the Most High. Amen. So there is a veil that we put. We overcome the shame of what people look. You see, you are now looking at me, the grown-up transformed version of what God has worked in my life. I was not all the time like that. I will do everything opposite to what the pastor will say. If you say clap hands, yeah, sure. <laughs> when he say let us all stand, I'll sit. When he say sit, I'll stand. I'll just do everything opposite. You are trying to show your rebellion part. I don't know for what, but you know, make a statement. What statement? Nobody cared who you are to start with. But when Jesus came, something changed inside. You are taking the instructions inside because you are learning how to respond to the things of God. Amen. Amen. Here the Bible says, sit at my right hand. I believe God is bringing us to a position of maturity that you're about to sit at my right hand. Because you can't tell a baby to sit. You carry a baby. Baby doesn't know how to respond to that level of instruction. A toddler won't be able to sit at the... You are basically going to put him in your lap. But to sit is a level of respond. Sit. Come and sit. That means there is a level of maturity that person have grown up. Amen? Amen. Now sit at my right hand. Until I make your enemies your footstool. We are going to look at it in this whole chapter in the next couple of weeks that we are here together. But let's all start up one or two verses for, for this time that will permit us. Number one. Sitting at the right hand always speaks about a position of victory. It is a position of victory. It's a position that you are sitting with the king. Whenever you are going through your challenge, through the troubles that we are praying for, no matter how big our problem is and how gigantic the situation can be, when God says, come and sit with me, it is already for a start, a position of victory. Are you with me? You start with the right note, sitting with the king. He may deal with our excesses. He may deal with certain areas which are not right in the whole composite of our prayer. Because there's a lot of, we always start with the spirit and we add salt and pepper into it and make it look like, you know, God. It's all for you. Yeah, sure, right. Mm. Take away what I don't like. If it's for me, I get to choose. Ah, very weak, amen. Let me see. Let's try this group. If it's really for me, then I choose. Amen. If you say, God, this is for you, then let me choose what I want. Take away your flesh away from it. When God chooses for you, it is much more exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask, think, and imagine. In order to have that faith, you must trust God. That He means good things for you. Some of the things that happens to me now, the Lord spoke to me when I was 16 and 17. I had no clue why He was telling me then. But it's happening now. It's as though your spirit was able to capture future things that is about to happen. Sit at my right hand. A position of authority, a position of knowing, a position of operating on the right side, and that right side is the side of God. 
you are not standing by the side of the enemy. You are not standing by the side of your problems. You are not sitting by the challenges you are going through. You are not going to speak like your bank. You're not going to speak like someone who's going to take away. Don't represent your bank to God. Represent you to the bank. Do you understand? When we come in God. God, you know what the bank is saying? They're going to take off this. You know what the, the application is saying? I will not get. But you know what God is about to do? If He calls you, it's going to happen. And sometimes it's a tug of war in our hearts when we are talking about the visa. Same challenge that we're going to go through. But I decided to rest in the peace of God. When God sees us worthy, He's going to get things done. Amen. Are you with me? What if this is my interim period of testing whether I'll do what God has sent me here for or not? But I think God has done much more than what we can really imagine. We cannot just be interested in the end result. We must be interested in the process of what God is doing in our life. Start off with a position of victory. When you are helping people to talk, when you are helping and counseling people, when you are, they are going through their challenges and doubt, always shift them back into the position of victory. That is where the child of God is supposed to be sitting. Somebody say, I don't feel like it, that's okay, come. I don't feel many times. I want to tell you one very powerful experience that I had, which I changed. My mentality of praying, that doesn't mean I carry my head around. You know, when we are praying, we are humble our hearts. And have you heard the old-fashioned prayer? Lord, I'm a worm. Have you heard this yeah. before? Because we pray like the book of Job. I'm a worm. What more worse description can you give to humble yourself? Can you please? Worm, some more? <laughs> oh, goodness. Roaches. I'm an ant. Red. <laughs> and if I'm God, I will call the pesticide company. <laughs> because my creation whom I created in my image, instead of talking like my children, they are talking like insects. <laughs> and I didn't die for insects. <laughs> I died for my children. Somebody say. Amen. You know, it's a feeling because we go through that level of pain. It's like a worm struggling inside. It could be a good picture. To see, I don't know how the modern day young sons and daughters will speak to God. Lord, I'm like the email that is not able to go through. <laughs> I don't know how you will put it out, man. Lord, I'm, I'm like the traffic that doesn't seem to grow. I'm crawling like the traffic lights. I don't know how we will speak in the modern language. I'm like the slowest DSLM dial up <laughs> modem. Do you remember those days? Oh my goodness, I don't know the patience we have to go through, bro. The modern day version of those scriptures. We try to impress God how much I'm struggling. But the truth of the matter is, the moment you come and stand, He can see your heart. A worship with the broken soul shows how much you are going through inside. When you pray with tears and silence, and sometimes your tears and silence become the cry of your soul, isn't it? Because you don't know what more to say. How much more must I be broken, O oh God? He looks at those things and he says, I want you to come. Come and sit beside me. Sit at my right hand. God is giving a position for Jesus, my King, to sit with Jesus on the right side. Somebody say. Amen. So I was in this prayer. I was praying this way. It was 4 o'clock in the morning. God, Angeline and I, we are your servants. And that day from a heaven in such a loud roar. No! I got so frightened. I f why did the Lord shout at me? No! You are not my servant. When he said the second line, I stopped. I thought something's going wrong here. I thought maybe I've an unconfessed sin or something that I... 
did not do it right. And sometimes you can create false humility, right? We go through the rituals of saying certain lines. Lord, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. And da, 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 da. You are not my servant. The Lord said, the next third line, you are my son and she's my daughter. Come up, I will speak to you. And a hand came inside my room and the Lord lifted me up. And for the next one and a half hours, I was close to the throne of Jesus. He was sitting like that. His throne, his chair, and I was standing there and he was telling me those things that is about to happen in the church, in the nations of the earth. He said he will go and speak my word as my prophet. Amen. Amen. There is a place of humility. There is a position of humility. There is a place to say, God, we are your servants. But there is also a place to say, God, I'm your son. I'm not a nobody. If I can't talk to you, who else is there a God that I can talk to? I can't talk to a stone. No one else has mercy like you have. No one else who loves me that like you do. No one else is a God who can do miracles like you can. There is only one name that I can come and that's your name. You got to talk to God like a son, like a daughter, who will never take no for an answer. If you don't know how to do it, go back to your children and observe them. <laughs> they will never take no for an answer. They will cry, they will stand upside down, pull, show all the tantrum till you say, okay, go, go, once, go. <laughs> Do that. Learn some lessons. Pay your children some money to teach you how to do that. <laughs> because some of us don't have those skills. Before you even say, when you appeared, your parents gave you already. <laughs> so you don't know how to be persistent in prayer, in travail and intercession, where the Bible says, plead your case before me. Say it out. What do you want me to do now? It's not that God doesn't know what to do. You see, he wants you to know that you have the right to pray. Number two, he wants you to pray what he is thinking about you. Sometimes we ask, our hearts are full of our own desires. God wants us to come into that alignment. Do you desire what I desire for you? You get what I'm saying? It's a position of authority we're going to start. I don't care who has made, or I shouldn't say I don't care. It's a very American term. I do care. I'm saying it politely because we have said it so many times. Preachers all the time preach it. I don't care. I don't care. And then why are you caring? So I don't want to say those terms. Let me see. It doesn't really matter which demon has made an assignment on Shelby. Our God has cancelled all of those debts. It doesn't matter. This land belonged to who? Originally it belonged to Jesus anyway. We are not defending what the, 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 the Americans did against the native, uh, uh, native uh, Americans. We are not really defending into the storyline. We are getting into what Jesus is telling us to do. Hi. Do you know when we set the captives free, it's also releasing those spirits that are mingling around for justice of what it happened to their people. God will release them from being captive. Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, those are deep stuff, man. Those are deep stuff. Some lingering spirits that are always crying out for justice. Now, where do we get this, uh, this scripture? You'll find in the book of Genesis, when Cain killed Abel, yes? yes. The Bible says the blood of the innocent is pleading before God. So there is something like when injustice is done to the innocent, that blood will plead before the Creator. There is a, so when God sets the captives free, it sets everybody free. Amen. That is why the church, it is important to take our positions of authority. When the church reaffirms its position right, then you will take your position at home right. As a father, as a mother, as a head high priest of the home, we will declare the mercies of God even in our house. Amen. It's a position of authority. 
It's a position of the spirit. Now, the second thing the Lord reminded me to tell you is this. Sit at my right hand. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand until what? Until what? Say the word until in an until way. Okay, let's try. Huh? One, two, three. Until. until I. Oh, you got to re-emphasize the word until. Are you ready? One, two, three, go. Until. Sit at my right hand until. Who? Look at the scripture. The Lord says, say that again. The Lord says. The Lord says. The Lord says. So it's not what Google is saying. It's not what my circumstance is saying. It's not what my body is saying. It's not what the doctor's report is saying. It's not what the devil is saying. It's what the Lord says will come to pass. It's not my feeling. It is not my report card. It's not my education system. It's not the tax rebate. It's not what the future of the government. It's what God says. I got to anchor, man. Only speak what the Lord is saying. It's difficult for us to think through. And that is why the more difficult it is, the more deeper you got to dig inside and bury your head like the, uh, like the ostrich inside. Don't come out. The moment you come out, there are a lot of doubts. <laughs> you got to bury it inside. Don't see anything outside. Bury your head into the scripture. The Lord says, people may love at you. People may think something is going on with you. Yes, brother, God is at work. That's what's going on. Amen. God is reconstructing my mind. Yes. That's what is going on. I'm trained to think like the world. Now I'm thinking like God. Yes. It's going to take time. How long? I don't know. I don't care. I just want to do it. Amen. Bury myself. The Lord says. We find it difficult to believe what the Lord says. We find it difficult, oh brother, let's be real. Oh, come on, man. If I would have been real today, I've been broke. Because my father had no money and it's not his fault, you know. He had no education. He, he came in through the, uh, during uh, the British Empire when they, uh, when they occupied Singapore during the war times. And he came over and they were poor. They have to work through the hard life. It's not their fault. But you see, the moment I'm born again, my father in heaven adopted me. So now I belong to my heavenly father. My heavenly father for, will pay for my education. He will pay for my future. I am not now for my earthly father, but my heavenly father has legally adopted me. And I'm not even mucking around with my statement. You know, I had no father to bring me to the mall to buy for me shirt, but when I will go there, I will ask God, what do you think? You think this is okay? Because I had no one else to ask. And many times the Lord has spoken to me. Not, not this color, go and keep that color. He said, oh, don't be so spooky spiritual man. You got to go through what I go through for you to understand what it means to walk with your heavenly father. But doesn't mean that you have to be abundant. See God more and beyond. See God, not just God, but your father. I've told him whenever I'm riding my motorcycle, God, come on, put on your helmet, sit behind, you are safe, let's go. I'm not riding alone. He said he will never leave me nor forsake me. Are you with me? I don't know how he handles when Angeline is sitting beside. I don't know how he squeezes himself in, but somehow he's with me. <laughs> hey, that's the truth. I walk in that reality. Do you? Hey, do you leave Jesus behind? I'm just asking you. Let's talk religious now. Are you leaving Jesus behind? I'm going to prayer. So, Lord, I pray you are with me. Da, 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 da. And uh, thank you for being here, God. 
In Jesus' name, Amen. Okay, bye. So, he goes back. What happens to him? <laughs> Why are you saying Amen? I don't know. That's what everybody say we say. <laughs> but he doesn't stop following me. He's closer to me than a shadow. Yes. Even my shadow can lie, but he does not. My shadow changes position depending on the sun. But God doesn't. Why I'm saying amen is to conclude my conversation but not conclude my relationship. Are you with me? Yes. And that's the scary part. <laughs> he follows everywhere. <laughs> Even if you go inside the bar, he's going to follow you. Even if you go places where he shouldn't be, he's following you. He's not going to let you go for a minute, my friend. Hallelujah. It's something I cannot understand. The love and the mercies of God. The Lord says, Lord, many churches are not making it in Shelby, okay? The Lord says you are going to make it. The Lord says, I will pay for it. The Lord says there will be an army that will rise out of this church. Somebody say. Amen. The Lord says. What is the Lord saying? Listen. The word of the Lord brought the entire universe together. We believe that. We believe God created this earth. We know Jesus resurrected from the dead. And, but yet we don't obey. I know you can do all these things. Whether or not you can do for me is the question. I'm not sure about that. We need to come back to this position where what God says. See, sometimes you don't know what God says because you're not reading the Bible. You got to read the Bible. Are you with me? Amen. There is no way you can know what God says if you don't read the Bible. You got to read the Bible. Somebody say, read the Bible. Okay, I want to bring you into a position. First Kings chapter 18. How many of you are learning something this morning? Amen. We are talking about preparing our heart to reign with Christ. It can be any situation. If your challenge is believing God for a $50 a, a week, let's start with that $50 a week first. Let's not bother about the $5,000 you need at the end of the month. Let's work small and go big after that. Is that okay? Are you with me? When we started our family, you know, there are a lot of challenges, a lot of loans, a lot of stuff, a lot of these and a lot of that. There are so many things you need to pay. It's not like you as my brother and my sister, Singapore, a car costs us $80,000 to drive a car. For 10 years, by the way. $80,000. Now, how would you get a car without a loan? And you got to pay 10 to 20% down payment before you can even drive your car out. It's a different system of setup there. A house, a small house, costs about $400,000. A small apartment. And if it's a shoebox, that's about $200,000 over $1,000. Sometimes it could be $100,000 over $1,000, depend on the location, cemetery, blah, 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 out of the nowhere. Nine, and by the way, 99 years only. It's not freehold. So when you start up your marriage in a house, man, you are into loan with the government, with this, with that, and you're starting up. I used to draw a mountain on a drawing board right in front of my prayer room. Write all the different banks, different loans that I've got to pay, including our daily expenses and monthly expenses. And speak into this mountain that these mountains will be cast out. I know that this mountain is going to take about 20 years. But nothing can stop me from speaking. The mountain may not stop. The mountain is still there. But God is elevating my position. The mountain is no longer a mountain because I am going up. Somebody say amen. amen. Because God is not just about to keep you like a baby for you to overcome, overcome and overcoming is the strength of a matured one. That means God is elevating the church. 
God is teaching us how to overcome. God is teaching us how to command, how to speak the word of God. Not from a baby position, but it's elevating us. Amen. What happens now when you come to this position, you now become a blessing to others around you. We cannot forget that. The very purpose of blessings in our life is that we become a blessing to others around us. It's a position of victory. What is the Lord saying to you? Write down. Start off with the $50 a week. Believe God that He can do it. You don't know how. You don't have to know how. The Lord says, I will provide. What if He suddenly say, Son, there is an opening for a week in the gas station. Would you go and be the attendant? Why not? God is making a way for you. But I don't like grease. Yeah, sure, whatever, man. Hello, are you listening? Because we are used to having free money. We want to put a sign about God. You know, can you, somebody, please? No, somebody. I'm going to teach you how to work, and I'm going to teach you how to work hard. Every blessing comes by working hard. Somebody say amen. amen. You are not an invalid for you to give you free money. God has given you all the strength you need. You got to work up on your attitude and start working right. <laughs> it amazes me when people serve the tables in the restaurant, how polite they are and you're willing to tip someone just because they are polite. Somebody say, Amen. Amen. Politeness gets money. How is that? Amazing, isn't it? When they smile and say thank you, more money is coming. And those are the times even though you are silently suffering, God moves the heart of the giver. Have you been there before? God does those things. I remember a pastor came to our church for prayer and I was praying for him. I was prophesying. He was crying. And he was crying. And the Lord says, while he's doing all that, write him a thousand dollars chair. say, What? Well, sister, which is just sitting there, you can ask her. She's the one I will always run to say, okay, before the guy leaves, make sure, you know, the money goes out to him. Second time, write a thousand dollars check. I said, for what? <laughs> you know, oh, brother, baby, oh, hey. and then I'm prophesying. The Lord is saying, huh? I said, the Lord, he just came in for prayer. I know, right? But God, we need the money. <laughs> he said, it's not your money. <laughs> It's mine. And I say, give it. And before the pastor left, quickly, we wrote a check. And that happened to me in Cincinnati again. This time was not the church money. He said, write your check. <laughs> what? Really? Sure? Are you sure? Let's do the three witnesses first. <laughs> Who's the one? <laughs> Every time it's your money, you do the three witnesses test. <laughs> hey, I will learn how to hear Jesus, man. I don't have to do the three witness test. I know his voice. Hey, hey, hey. I don't have confidence. Did you hear that? Angeline, where are you? Did you hear that? It's our money. No, no, she didn't. She was busy doing other things. But I heard that. You know why? The money that I've got in my bank account belongs to him. He's trusting me with his money. Would you be able to say that? Would you be able to say the money that I've got, whatever that is there, if it's a couple of cents, it still belongs to him. If it's in between, it belongs to him. If there is zero, that account still belongs to him. He will top it up. He will not embarrass you. Somebody say amen. amen. He lifted you up out of darkness. The Bible says he lifted you up out of shame. How am I going to pray for my children? It is the Lord's responsibility. Because beyond my earthly thinking, our heavenly Father will look after our children. Amen. The Lord says, God, let's come back to reframe ourselves. The Lord says. We were praying in Cincinnati for a pastor and his wife and, and the Lord said, write a check for a thousand. Oh no, the same one again. <laughs> And three times, and before he could even stop crying, I ran to my way. Please do not use that trick on me. Please do not pray. Lord, tell my pastor to write a thousand dollars.
And it happened again. My question is, God will bring us to a position where it's easy to give now. You know why? When you give, it shall be given unto you. Amen. You're no longer frightened to give. Amen. You have the fear of the Lord inside your heart. Are you with me? Yes. It makes no sense. God doesn't need to consult the committee. <laughs> Did you ask the committee? God, the Father, and the Son. Committee decided, yes, give. When you want to do a good deed, let's do it with the fear of God. Yes. The Lord says, the Lord says, the Lord says. In 1 Kings chapter 18, remember last Sunday I had to do a little bit of a disco, what Elijah did? <laughs> did you remember or not? Yes. Okay, please go back to the video, please look. <laughs> Every Saturday night I have to try my dance moves before I preach. 1 Kings chapter 18. There was a showdown in verse 19. Chapter 18, verse 19. When Ahab saw Elijah. Okay, look at the a translation experience that Elijah had, okay? Verse 11. Now Obadiah appeared. Good, verse 11. Chapter 18, verse 11. Now and now you say, what happened the background is, there's a prophet called Obadiah who was working together with King Ahab. Remember who is Ahab? Yes. Who? Jezebel's yes. husband. Who is Jezebel? We don't care. Now, <laughs> she. <laughs> so Obadiah was there, right? So he, King tells Obadiah, go and find out where Elijah is because Elijah is nowhere to be found. People say he's here, he's there. And then Obadiah tells a secret. Look at verse uh, 11. And now you say, go and tell my Lord, behold, Elijah is here. He met Elijah on the way. And Elijah tells Obadiah, go and tell King Ahab, I'm coming there to see him. Obadiah says, verse 12, as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I do not know where. Now, this is one proof how Elijah was traveling around by the commands of God. He was taken in the spirit to different locations and it became a reputation of those prophets during those times that Elijah was always carried by the spirit of God. He appears here, he appears there and appears there. No one can find him where he is. That is why Elijah is one of the only prophets in the Bible who we do not know where he started from. In 1 Kings chapter 17, Elijah comes out. Nobody knows where he, this guy is from. The Spirit of God, boom, comes into the story. Okay? Now he says, verse 17, Ahab saw Elijah and Ahab said to him, Is it you, the traveler of Israel? What kind of reputation? Reverend troublemaker. I like the word, man. I like to be addressed, I'm the travel of Israel, I've come here, I've come into Shelby, <laughs> I've come to travel the enemy, I did not come to peace negotiate, I did not come to negotiate with the enemy, I've come to take over, somebody say, I'm not here to give me half of the land, I come to possess the land in Jesus name, am I speaking to warriors? Or warriors? Warriors. We are not here to negotiate. We will be known as the troublemakers. Let it be known. That's all good. He said, I didn't come to trouble you. You and your father's house have done it. Because you have abandoned the commandments of God and followed after idols. When we run after idols, there is a trouble that will come from the kingdom of darkness against us, against the city. But I want to bring your attention. Now, I, you know, I, 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 I'm so afraid to get into this whole process and then I don't want to tell you what I want to say. So let me go at verse 36. I'm going to show you a revelation probably you could have never seen. Are you ready? Yes. Okay, verse 36. Probably Larry won't know this. 
You know how Larry speaks to me all the time? Pastor, I want to tell you something you don't know. <laughs> it's my turn. <laughs> and at that time of the offering, of the oblation, Elijah the prophet, can you tell me what's next? And said, Okay, enough, enough. Look up. Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord, it tells me the Lord was there standing all the time watching what he was doing. Only Elijah could see Jesus standing there. He told, can you believe the prophets of Baal, 450 of them, and the prophets of Asherah, 400 of them. Let me, am I giving you the right uh, statistics? 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. They all were there. They didn't know what to do. Elijah is giving them the instruction. Cut the bull, put on the altar, dance around, cut, and they were following Elijah's instruction. That's a foolish thing to do. They were following his instruction. And, and see, the Bible says they dance around chanting. So I was doing a biblical dance. They did that. The Bible says it. And now he says, oh, looks like he's not coming. Cut yourself, you forgot. So they were cutting yourself. And the blood was dripping. Nothing happened. Listen. Hey, please don't do this. Please don't go and tell everybody else. Look at what he's doing. Verse 27. Go to verse 27. At noon, Elijah... What? Now, please don't try this in spiritual warfare. This is Elijah. Elijah mocked them saying, Cry aloud, for he is God. Either he's musing or he's relieving himself. Do you even dare to say those things? <laughs> you better know who you are, bro. <laughs> he's relieving himself or he's on a journey. Perhaps his sleep must be awakened. Oh my God. The moment he said that, they cried all the more and they're now cutting themselves after their custom. Okay, Elijah, we go back to verse 36. He came near and he says, God, listen, all the heroic things they just did, you told me to dig a trench. By the way, the scripture says he took 12 stones that represents the house of Israel, which we have done on King's Mountain. He took 12 stones and he rebuilt the altar. And he said, dig a trench around the altar, pour water. Do you remember? And then he said, do it the second time. Now do it the third time. And the water was overflowing out. After doing all the heroic things, he goes to God. He comes near and he says, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. Hello, can you talk faster, please? Let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, okay? I'm your servant, yes. And I have done all these things at your I done all these things at your? That means God was whispering to him, tell them to do this. Tell them to do that. It was not Mo, uh, Elijah showing off. It was God who's about to show off to the enemy. Somebody say. Amen. He did everything in God's command. Now that is the responsibility of an anointing. You don't misuse the gift that God has given to you. You don't do things in presumption and use the name of God. You don't try to behave like a baby, but you know, by faith, when you are a prophet and God has lifted you up, there are things you got to do when He tells you to do it. And faith becomes the accompanying agent. There are, th in the area where you don't know what God is asking you to do, then we will be like a little baby. By faith, we will do things. Are you with me? God will help us to experience the different degrees of maturity. And something that you and I must get used to it. 
If not, we are all the time yakking away like a baby when God wants us to mature in certain areas of revelation that you have gathered over time. Some of us, we have revelation for money, but we are weak in healing. Some of them will be strong in healing, but they are weak in other areas. But the areas you are strong, He will expect you to show maturity when you come to that areas. Are you with me? Yeah. We cannot pretend, God, I don't know, you know, I know, you know, and nobody knows. <laughs> he did exactly what the Lord told him. Man, this is serious, man, Elijah. The point that I'm trying to tell you is this. Victory comes when we do what God tells us to do. Even though it may seem the most ridiculous thing to do because God told you to do something. How many of you know that when you are going through some form of a trouble and then there is a brother or sister who have a similar trouble and God tells you, go and pray for that person. And you feel terrible, isn't it? God, I need your miracle. Why are you telling me to pray for them? Is when you are broken, you know what it is to go through that brokenness. And do you realize when you are praying for others, you are able to prophesy, and that word is also for you. There was your breakthrough. In brokenness when we sow, in, in, our, in our times of discouragement when you sow encouragement, when you have nothing when you sow to others, when we are hopeless yet we sow hope to others, there Christ is magnified. My brothers and sisters, we are learning the ways of God this morning. Amen. Amen. Just do what the Lord tells you to do. Victory is waiting for the church that is willing to do what God wants us to do at this time. The only thing that God is saying now, first I shared with you, the Lord says, I'm going to wrap, wrap it up by talking about the second word called until. Can you take it? Yes. Is it overcooking now? No. It's like in a restaurant when you're going ordering steak. What, how would you like your steak to be? Rare, medium, medium well, Overdone, burnt. Which one you want? <laughs> the word until, how many of you are learning something? Listen guys, I, I, I'm not preaching to impress me or impress you. The word of the Lord has such depth when we look at it. It's like, oh my, it's like milk and honey, isn't it? First, we learn sit as a position of authority. Number two, we learn, do only what the Lord says. It's a training. It's under command. A friend of mine, we were in the army together. He went to the specialized commando training school. Then he went into the rangers course. Then he went for the specialized sniper training. They put them on the tree top. They have to go for the sniper training. They cannot come down from the tree for two weeks. You relieve yourself, you got to tie it up in a bag and just throw from the tree. The food rations is what the army gives you and when you're up, you're up. Your job is to hit the commander of the enemy's camp. But they won't tell you when the enemy camp is coming out and when it's the commander. You are supposed to find out. Your job is to hit the enemy. You talk about patience, that's where it is trained. See, one of the things about being trained by God is learning to wait for the timings of God in your life. God says, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Until I do it. And God is waiting for us. Somebody say amen. amen. Psalms chapter 40 verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord and he heard, he inclined to me and heard my cry. I was in a train station about to board somewhere years ago when the Lord told me, read this scripture, Psalms 41. And I opened and I looked, wow, I waited patiently for the Lord. 
He inclined to me and heard my cry. Then the Lord asked me, Son, are you waiting for me or for the miracle? Do you get what I'm saying? Most of the time we wait for the miracle, but God wants you to wait for Him. Wait for the Lord. Some miracles require all night progress. <laughs> the Bible says in Exodus chapter 14, I'm going to go to you three scriptures and we are done. Okay? Exodus chapter 10 verse 13, Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt and the Lord brought an east wind upon the land all that day and all that night. When it was morning, the east wind had brought the locusts. Did you see that? Did you see that? In order for the east wind to be there in the morning, God has to cause a wind throughout the day, throughout the night, from another location, get this locust to migrate to be where Moses was praying. In other words, when we are sleeping, God is working. That is the power of waiting for God to do a miracle. It takes process, it takes time, it takes patience. While we are waiting patiently, whatever we are praying will go berserk, will go adverse. It tells us, the Bible says, that after many times, Zechariah, wife, conceived, right? You remember that scripture? But it does, the Bible doesn't tell us, as a woman, as a husband, all of us know. That means they have been trying to conceive every month, every year. And every time, the results was not good. Probably it was aborted. Probably there was premature abortion. Whatever that happened, the fetus didn't go through. Oh, you understand what I'm saying? All the emotional pain of every woman who was trying to conceive. What the Bible doesn't say those emotions to us. It only shares with us that miracle point of that day. Now, her womb conceived. This is real, brothers. Real sisters. And I've been a counselor to married couples for years. The pain some of them go through trying to conceive a baby. The miracles they have to pray. The fasting some of them have to go through because the body is not responding. The tears and the shame whenever there is a mother's day. They can't respond. Some of them have lost their children, you know. The pain that we go through and we stand in the gap and pray for such young uh, mothers that they will conceive. Until I make the enemies your footstool. Let me wrap it up with the last scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 13, 13, I'll give you one example first. 1 Samuel chapter 10. My brothers and sisters, I take the trouble to show you the scripture so you know whatever I'm saying, it's there. It's inside there. It's not what I think or what's my opinion. It is there. We are thought by God. Amen. 1 Samuel chapter 10, verse 6, 7, and 8. Now you know, King Saul was not really God's choice. Whose choice was it? The people's choice. They chose him. God decided, okay, let's, let's see whether your choice is good choice. Eh? They chose him. And then verse 6, then the Spirit of the Lord will rush upon you and you will prophesy with them and be turned into another man. Verse 7. Now when these signs meet you, do what your hand finds to do for God is with you. Now, I'm not going to talk about that. That's not our subject. Look at verse 8. Then go down before me to Gilgal. Go down where? 
before me. Then before I come, you must be there. And behold, I'm coming down to you to offer burnt offerings, to sacrifice peace offerings. Now let's look at the next word. Seven days you shall until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Now this is prophet Samuel telling King Saul. Prophets in the Old Testament have power over kings. They are higher in spiritual authority. He's telling how many days must you wait? And what time the seven days finish? 12 midnight probably. Correct? Complete the seven days. Now, 1 Samuel chapter 13 verse 8, the Bible says, Saul was waiting. Seventh day. But the time clock is still running. Samuel didn't show up. So while he was waiting and Samuel delayed in coming, the people were getting crazy. So King Saul does what a king should not do in the Old Testament. Make sacrifices and present it before God. Later on in that passage, King Saul will say, I did it because the people pressured me to do. Do you know there are a lot of people who became pastors because people pressured them to become a pastor? They're not called by God. Some people pressure, Pastor, let's, let's break off from here and start our own church. You be the pastor, we'll pay for you. And they became pastors and then they walked out from the will of God. Are you listening? Yes. There are a lot of people who have done that. And God is cleaning up His church. You see, when you have not been broken or made by God, you will not know how to respond to the processes of God. Are you with me? Now, any woman who have rich or young girl who have rich puberty, she has the ability to become a mother. Yes or no? Yes. But how you become a mother is the question. Do it in the right way. That's what God is teaching us, right? So this is the right way of doing. And Samuel comes and then in verse 13, he makes a, com a, a, a comment. Let's look at verse 13. 1 Samuel chapter 13, verse 13. Okay? And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God with which he commanded you. Now guys, listen. Let's play the role of Saul at the moment for a few seconds. Hey, Samuel. All this time, you are the one who's talking to me, man. You did not even say, God says. You just told me to wait seven days. It is you. How come now you are saying, it is the command of God? Are you following? It doesn't make sense, man. If you say it's the command of God, you should have told me, thus saith the Lord. But you didn't say. You said it so naturally. You shall wait. And now you are saying, the Lord God said it. And now you are saying, I did not obey God. Now he's saying, look at that. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever. You will keep on reading. This chapter is an interesting chapter. Go home. Try to follow up. You will say, because you did not obey the word of God, the kingdom will be taken away from you. This is what I wrote. When the Lord told me to tell you, today I'm telling you. Our casualness to spiritual counsels will cost you dearly in this season. Pay attention to God's counsels over your life. I am preaching God's word out fasting, seeking God's mind and speaking to you. Now if you take it so casually, you'll miss what God is speaking to you. Because we are so used to thinking Pastor is just saying what a man would preach. But if that man is receiving the counsels from God, and if he's telling you what God is wanting you to do, don't bring your casualness of friendship and relationship to take away the counsels of God. Are you with me? Yes. We don't really have to say, Thus saith the Lord all the time. Pay attention to the whispers of the Holy Spirit. Pay attention to the story. Oh man, that... That must be God. Because God's counsels will come in a way unawares. 
You know how scary these things are? It's very scary. But these are the counsels of God. I will share with you one very interesting thing that happened in my army days. To break away a little bit of this mood that I'm creating. But are you hearing what I'm saying? <laughs> it's a good counsel. It's a good counsel. But do you get what I just said? We don't need prophecy all the time to finish the three minutes. I am prophesying for this one hour. Hear the counsels of God. I may say things now, this is what we do. Don't let the casualness of our friendship take away that moments of counsel. Pay attention to what God is saying to us. So I was in the army, right? So we go through shooting, main exercises. Uh, SOC, Standard Obstacle Course. Basic military camp. Shooting exercises, which I was a marksman. I tell you how I became a marksman. And swimming with all the gear. Okay. So on Sundays, because I'm a church frock, I couldn't shoot on a Sunday. I'm thinking, oh, the people are praying. Boom, it went out. People are worshipping. Boom, it goes out. Lord, I wish I should be in church. Boom, nothing goes in. Because my mind was not on my target. It was in church. I'm talking about two months of not attending service, man. And just like, I was like <gasps> going through fits in the camp, you know. Honestly, I'm just, I'm not adding on now. I'm honestly, that's how I felt. And I was scolded by my regimental sergeant major. Out of 200 people, I could not shoot. And if you fail the shooting, M16, you have to repeat the entire three months basic military again. I was so embarrassed. You are a Christian. What kind of Christian are you? What kind of God are you worshipping? That guy was mocking and back mouthing in front of the 200 cadets, right? He was like a demon out of hell that came specially for me. <laughs> I went back so rejected. My brother was at home. Uh, that was the weekend. After the Saturday shoot, I went back. We were staying inside camp for... Two and a half months already without coming home. That once afternoon, we had five hours off to go home, come back. I went home. I was so rejected. My heart and my spirit was so heavy. My brother was sitting there. I said, how are you? I didn't want to talk to him. I went home to the room. I went to the kitchen, make a cup of tea and uh, drinking. How was your camp? I kept quiet. Then I told him with tears all running down, you know, my shooting exercise. He said, and the angel tells me, I said, don't you dare to tell me what the angel is saying. I'm very upset. Don't say anything anymore. He said, no, the angel is really telling. I don't want to know. <laughs> he said, listen, if you don't want to hear, I'm going to finish my line and you think whatever you like. The angel is saying, when you are back into the next Monday morning, in your range, call the angel to help you. He will help you. I said, okay, now angels know how to use M16. Yeah, sure, man. <laughs> I was getting very angry. I didn't want to talk to him. I just kept quiet. And my brother didn't want to talk to me. He went to the room. He said, I was really mad because of this emotion. And to another guy to say, the angel knows how to fire weapons. I thought they always fly. And they sing beautiful, lovely songs, you know. You don't have combat trained army angels. <laughs> so the next Monday, on Monday morning, range exercise, straight away. And that Monday is our night shoot, which is, happens at about 8 o'clock in the night. Under the moonlight, you'll start shooting without any lights, actual training uh, uh, test. And that day, remember what Sadhu said? What he said? The angel will help. Okay. And my sergeant who stands beside me is the number one sergeant who migrated out of hell. <laughs> Stephen, you're going to lose. You're going to come back. I'm going to train you and you can't do it. <laughs> and yeah, I'm saying, God, please help me. God, please help me. And I make sure you will come back to the army. I will make sure. And this hell speaks out right out of him, right? 
And I said, Angel, listen, I'm going to aim. You tell me when to fire, I will just pull, man. <laughs> I hope you know how to do it. The guy, all, everyone, the first detail is already, they say, fire! Boom! Pam, pam, pam. The first is a tracer, means there's light. And I just, pam, pam. After the first round, everything did not go in. I know it. You're going to come back. I say, Angel, what's wrong with you? Are you blind? <laughs> I thought, I can't shoot, you can't shoot. Lord, is there any other angels to come? <laughs> but I could hear audibly when the angel said, fire. And I did. I aimed, and as though, you know, someone was holding my arm. It's not that I didn't know how to do it. I was so confused, so troubled. As though someone was holding my arm, and I could hear the voice of God. Fire, and a boom, we went through seven rounds, 28 rounds. That was the test. Is either you pass that day or you repeat your three months. Our final exam day. Three o'clock in the morning, all the names were called out one by one and the report cards were read out of 24, out of 28, blah, 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 blah. And my name didn't come out. It was already four in the morning. I said, finish. God sent me an angel who is blind as me. I'm done. <laughs> and this... Sergeant from hell won. I said, God, my heart. You know what? I know what the regimental sergeant major is going to bump me right in front of everybody, right? My name was not called out. He said, recruit Stephen Fallen. I cannot do exactly what I did. I'm demo, so I cannot do this way. <laughs> so let me do. <laughs> hey, are you enjoying? Make sure you put a better offering afterwards, eh? <laughs> Yes, sir. Out of 24. Oh, the fellow kept on going and on and on and on and on and on and on. Out of the 200 cadets for the day, recruit Stephen Francis is the only one who got his marksmanship today. Are they what? <laughs> Hello. Are you okay? Did you say something wrong? What do you mean marksman? Out of 28, everything was bull's eye. Thank you. <laughs> you know what I did? I walked to the sergeant major. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Listen, I've learned something from God. Every time when God gives you a miracle, it becomes your gift. Whenever God teaches you something, it becomes your skill. It doesn't always remain as a miracle. It becomes your skill set. Every year in the army, we have to go for marksman training. We have to go for shooting exercises. Until now, I'm maintaining my marksman test. I'm still maintaining my score sheet. Till now means the last one that I went. Are you with me? God can create a miracle that it becomes part of you because you are dependent on Him. I could have write off my brother that day, but I remember at the end of the day, no matter what casual we are talking, cup of tea, he is a prophet of God. When he tells me something, you better pay attention. And there are many times like that, me and my brother, we can be brothers, we argue over things, we get upset over stuff, but when he gives me a counsel, I pay attention to it. And it has seen itself through. Amen. I pray do not let the casualness of our relationship in church steal away the counsels that I bring from the presence of God. Pay attention. If there is a word that God is speaking to you Sunday after Sunday, if there is a word that God wants you to bring you outward, only God knows which part of this message or any other message means to your situation. Pay attention. Let's wrap up with the same scripture. Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand up together and pray. Come on. Father, we thank you for this morning. Would you take a few moments to say thank you, Jesus? Would you take a few moments to say thank you for the word? Would you take a few moments to say thank you for your love? Would you take a few moments to say thank you for the position that God you have given to me? 
Thank you, Father. You know our circumstances. You know our challenges. You know the bills that we need to pay. You know the job problems that we are going through. Yet we will just pay attention. The Lord says, Father, let there be miracles. Let there be answers to prayer. Let there be financial blessings. Let there be medical breakthrough. Thank you for continuing to protect us from all the COVID challenges. You are greater than COVID. Thank you for the hand of God upon our children. You are greater than COVID. Thank you for the freedom that you have given to us. You are greater than any challenge of God. We will continue to worship you in Jesus my King. We will continue to honor you in Jesus my King. We will continue to follow you in Jesus my King. Let your word and your presence become real. Teach us the secret counsel of God. So that we will become your sons and daughters. That we will continue to love you, grow with you and to mature with you we love you father whatever that cannot be done my man man the bible says it is possible with god my brothers and sisters this morning we bring our most impossible situation to God. Let God make it possible. Whatever you can think of an impossible situation, bring it to God right now in your heart and in your mind and whisper it before the Lord. This is it, God. Show us your power. Show us your power. Show us your power. Father, we pray for all those who are watching through this video. We pray for the power of God to touch them, reach out to them no matter where they are. Challenges with their community, government, work, unemployment. Challenges to meet the bills at home for the family. I pray your love will create a miracle, God. I want to thank you that you are a God who can be depended on. You are the miracle working God. We praise you and we honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a wonderful clap offering. God bless you guys. Hallelujah.